Good morning. Welcome again to our discourse on dance in India. How over centuries we have shaped our dance traditions <clears throat> from classical to folk to modern. Yes, today with all of you I will share this journey of what can be called modern in an ancient culture. What is modern? If we go by theories there are many and dictionary meanings can at best be pedantic. Modern means a break from past. What is India's past in dance? We have to analyze and understand that before reaching the stage to understand what's modern dance in India today. Indian classical dance traditions have been born out of a sense of propitiation of the divinity. A certain spiritual content has always been its mainstay. It has also been essentially the art of the soloist, except in dance theatre forms. Over 2000 unbroken years, it has grown to become the longest continuous dance culture, affording an interesting insight into man and his relationship to stage in general and dance art in particular. Its classical nature comes through by a set of code of grammar, content and concept. Thus, if one form, the knees are to be bent while performing and a half sitting position maintained all through, then it cannot be altered. The position of hands, the use of eyes, neck and torso and feet all go towards making dance units which become strings of movements through which individual characteristics and grammar is set which makes each form distinct and thus with age and tradition classical. The content is mostly mythological. These forms evolved over centuries and it is believed that they were created to please gods and their representative on earth. The myth goes that the gods were bored and asked the wisest among them, Brahma, the creator, to create some form of entertainment that would involve and engage all. Brahma enlisted the help of sages of whom Bharata was given the specific task of writing a new Veda, the holy treatises of which four existing already, Rig, Sam, Yajur, Atharva, the fifth Veda called the Natya Shastra or Natya Veda. And through this work, the details of modern dramaturgy in India were born. When the gods saw their own stories enacted on a celestial stage, they were pleased and blessed the enterprise. They then requested Brahma that the same be taken to planet earth where by listening to such tales human beings would benefit by what is moral and what is righteous. Earthlings would live pious lives and these stories enacted through dance, drama and music will help reinstate myths and traditions. Thus the art of dance and drama were born to enlighten, entertain and educate human beings. Over centuries, these dance and drama traditions have crystallized to seven main classical forms of India. Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi from south on east coast in now state called Tamil Nadu, Kathakali from Kerala on southern west coast, Mohiniyattam also from the same region, Kathak from northern and central India, and Odissi from east and Manipuri from extreme northeast. In last decade, additions like Satriya from Assam in Northeast have been added out of bureaucratic and political considerations. That way, national poet Rabindranath Tagore's concoction of different forms too now seeks recognition as a form called Rabindranatyam. Regional aspirations fueled by ready-to-please bureaucrats and politicians wanting to become popular sometimes means some new forms will be added once in a while and boundaries between classical, folk, popular and ritual forms will get further blurred. Historians and dance buffs treat this as aberrations and accept as anomalies of times we live in. 
Each of the principal seven styles, Bharatanatyam, Kathak, Kathakali, Mohiniyattam, Manipuri, Kujupudi and Odissi, and add eighth, Satriya, that gained importance recently when it was recognized by the Sangeet Natak Academy in 2000, has set grammar and language and are practiced and taught traditionally from master to disciple. A minimum of 10 years of training is critical to gaining some basic level of proficiency. While Kathakali and Manipuri were group art, all others were art of the soloist. Each form was taught in a personalized manner and the tradition of Guru Shishya, master to disciple, was paramount. Gurus as master teachers were called were not found sitting in institutions waiting for students to come and pay. They were mostly benevolent father figures who took a very few truly talented wards under their wings to groom and prepare. This process was not bound by time, money or years, but could take a lifetime. Until the guru gave permission, a student could not perform or take to stage. Both the guru and the student had time for and commitment to art. Under a long colonial rule from 16th to 20th century ADE, most of these forms suffer from lack of patronage under the colonial rule, especially of the Britishers, whose Victorian ways and prudish nature did not permit an open celebration of the body and spirit, and who also looked down on traditional local cultures and did all to discourage it. Lord Macaulay, a trained certain British Roy, further killed traditional arts by delinking culture from educations in schools. Thus, traditional disciplines like yoga, reading of Sanskrit scriptures, and classical music and dance were given a go by. Local patronage by Indian chieftains and royalty assured some survival and continuity in certain pockets, else, most of these traditions would have been lost. In that, the role of local temples as cradle of culture cannot be underestimated, and local nobility supported these temples, thus, directly, these dances got supported. Victor Dandre, in 1922, on a visit to India, lamented, there are no schools of dancing in India, and it is an art which nobody is interested in. All he and his wife, the famed Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova, got to see in this visit, that too, in the first capital of India, Calcutta, was some variety of notch dances. And Pavlova's became a catalyst for encouraging two of India's biggest names, Uday Shankar and Rukmini Devi. In India, Pavlova had occasion to attend a wedding and now her attention turned to producing a ballet on this. A leading dancer with her, Harcourt Elgaranov, was directed to pore over books and visuals to cull ideas for the wedding ceremonies, costumes and setting. And next, a musician was found and the choice fell on a certain Bengali lass settled in London called Komalata Banerjee. She was auditioned and hired to do the music for the ballet, simply called a Hindu wedding. But she made a bigger contribution than this. She was aware of a young Indian boy dabbling in dance in London who was actually there to study painting and who may help Pavlova design the scenes or scenography for the dance production. The young lad was Uday Shankar, who not only designed the stage, but later also partnered Pavlova. Thus, Pavlova discovered Uday Shankar. He also choreographed another ballet for Pavlova, Krishna and Radha, in which Pavlova made him partner her. Thus, a dancer was born. The work of few pioneering gurus and visitors from abroad also helped these forms get established. The arrival of non-European artists to India at the turn of the 20th century also proved to be a catalyst. Among these, mention can be made of Ruth St. Denis and Ted Sean, pioneering American dancer Anna Pavlova and Victor Dandre, Russian star performers La Mary and Ragni Devi, enterprising American dancers Louis Lightfoot, Australian talent and many others. They saw the dismal condition of Indian dances submerge under a long alien rule of 400 years and felt sad for these century-old traditions. Dutch writers like Beryl de Zote and French and Italian travellers like Alain Denilio and Travenier wrote their observations that helped too. The foreign dancers 
took samples of these forms and helped create a flavor of these dances through their own interpretations, thus giving Indian dances a worldwide audiences and assured survival. These were in form of short items of Hindu dances with popular imagery. They also discovered new partners and thus created stars of the form. Thus, Anna Pavlova discovered and partnered Uday Shankar, who was to become father of modern Indian dance later. Love Mary discovered and partnered Ram Gopal, who was to become the king of classical forms. And Ragni Devi discovered and partnered Gopinath, who was to take Kathakali abroad. Ditto Louis Lightfoot and Anand Shevram. In 1927, another development took place. A personable young Indian lady in London, Leela Sokhi, met Pavlova and bemoaned that though she had been very keen on learning dancing in India, she could not make much headway. Pavlova immediately assigned Algarnov to teach Leela Sokhi. Leela was none other than Madame Menka in a later stage incarnation and did much for Indian dance in Western India based in Bombay. She was the first dancer to present Kathak at Berlin Olympics in 1936. In 1929, Pavlova was going to Australia via India and Java. Who boarded the ship in Madras? A young bride, Rukmini Devi Arundel, with her husband George Arundel. Their cabin was opposite Pavlova's, and one thing led to another, and Pavlova's staff choreographer, Cleo Nordi, inspired Rukmini to learn ballet while on the long journey. Later, Rukmini was not only to help reinstate Bharatanatyam, but also set up an institution, Kalakshetra, for its teaching. Pavlova visited India for the second time in 1928 to 29, and Menka worked with. Elgarnov and choreographed three stage dances, of which most notable was Naga Kanya Nitya. Did the inspiration come from Ruth and Dennis's Cobra dance? Ruth and Dennis and Ted Sean need little introduction to world dance audiences. Born Edwin Myers, the name Ted stuck on him, and Ruth was both his senior in age and experience, and the pioneer of modern American dance, who gave the dance world such leading lights as Martha Graham, Mary Wigman, and Charles Wigman. Martha said, Miss Ruth opened a door and I saw into a life. Like Isadora Duncan, who preceded her, Ruth was a revolutionary artist who felt the need to break from the limitations of Western ballet. She saw the salvation of the dance not so much in the rhythms of classical Greece as those of the Orient, Japan, China and India. Knowing fully well then that the Western mind was not much exposed to assimilate these deeply spiritual dances with their gestures and movements that have come down through long generations as symbols of legends, she made no attempt to reproduce them but for her aim was to give a fair and beautiful translation that would help American and European audiences come closer to Oriental cultures. In this, she proved to be a catalyst. Her many dances with Indian themes like Radha, Incense, Cobra and Notch made many come closer to things Indian and Ted Sean was drawn to her art and her. They married and Dennis Sean was born. The Dennis Sean company toured India until 1932 and they trained countless dancers. When the company landed in Calcutta in 1925, they wanted to see Indian dances, but found no signs of it. But thanks to effort of American consulate, they could meet some notch dancers. That too on the 18th day of their 20-day stay. As Ted Sean later wrote to India's father figure of Indian dance history, Mohan Kokar, during British rule of India, dancing was frowned upon due to mistaken norms of prudery. And all the Indians we met were embarrassed when we mentioned the word notch to them. The Shans were fortunate to meet star performers of the day, Bachwa Jan and Mallika Jan, both professing Kathak but of the Kotha variety. Ruth got so excited seeing them dance, she got up as if in a trance and danced. Seeing her dance, Bachwa Jan gave her the ankle belt she was wearing. A sign of highest affection and regard an Indian dancer can give other in courtly etiquette. They traveled through India and performed in Calcutta, Empire Theatres, Karachi, where they came in contact with young Muslim boys dressed up as girls and dancing a variety of Kathak and met Pandit Hiralal, a Kathak exponent from whom they learned Mohar dance or Peacock dance. They next went to Darjeeling, where at the Bhutia Monastery, they managed to see some Tibetan dances and in South they went to Madurai and Madras, where seeing Mablipuram. Ted was inspired to compose the dance of Shiva, Cosmic Dance in Nataraja, for which he got made a huge brass of ring of Shiva's fire made in metal by a Calcutta foundry, at center of which he stood himself and danced Shiva Nataraja. 
In the decade after this, the slow and steady revival of Indian dance traditions started and ABBA foreigners deserve credit for showcasing Indian dances worldwide, thereby creating not only an interest and a market abroad, but also opened the eyes of Indians to their own traditions. Nala Najan was born June 24, 1932 as Roberto Rivero, an Italian parent settled in USA. As a child, he was exposed to ballet, but Bharatanatyam became his life. For this, he left USA to come and learn from one of the finest masters of the form, Guru Muthukumaran Pillai of Katumanar Koil Chidambaram. This is the same master who taught giants of the form like Ram Gopal, Minalni Sarabhai, M.K. Saroja, Kamala Lakshman, among others. Additionally, he learned the violin and Bharatanatyam from Narayana Swami Ayer also. Arriving in India in the late 1940s, he immersed himself wholeheartedly in learning Bharatanatyam. For this, like all others of his ilk and time, he based himself in Madras and later after his guru left Madras for his native place, he decided to follow him to Chidambaram to be at the feet of the master. This spry lad from USA immersed totally into the art, dressing, talking and walking like the locals, so much so that because he was such a good boy, the locals named him Nalla in Tamil meaning good. Later for the stage, he added Najan to make it rhyme. He did everything that rhymed. He talked fast, walked faster and danced fastest. His training in ballet gave him immense balance as his own sprightly frame was a big help for him to control each limb. His Bharatanatyam was exquisite and his costumes regal. That was an era when men dressed regally. Modelled after Ram Gopal and Uday Shankar, his dexterity also made him learn a very few unknown form then, the Saraikala Chau. For this, he went to village of Saraikala with a letter of introduction from his close friend Mohan Kokar. The Maharaja of Saraikala welcomed him and he was stayed guest staying at the palace. In return, many years later, Nala Najan was instrumental in Saraikala Chau dancers touring the USA with Nala himself providing expert introductions. He was the first promoter of the form and enlisted Saul Hurok, no less as an impresario, to help the form reach many in the USA. His introductions and commentary on each form was very useful because way back then, Indian dances were not well known and clubbed with Oriental or Hindu dances, the snake charmer types. Nalanajan got India on the world dance map in USA academically, it can be said without hesitation, long before the university started teaching Indian dance. Nalanajan was a maverick, a man totally mad and besotted with Indian dance. His years spent learning in India vested with him the, with much knowledge and authority that he later used when he turned a critic in New York. He first helped Papa Ted Sean at Jacob's Pillow by introducing many Indian talents and some even go to perform there thanks to Nalanajan. Ted Sean and wife Ruth St. Denise had visited India themselves in the 1920s and seen dance art for themselves, fallen under British rule and wished to help revive it themselves in 1920s and seen dance under alien rule so they could help by their own example and performance. Nalanajan prodding enthused them further and they paid their debt back to India by promoting many Indian, including Bhaskar Roy Chaudhary and Rita Devi. Nala settled in USA. These foreigners helped reinstate Indian dance art and such activities got augmented by the slow and steady growth of a nationalist fervor in pre-independence era, when Indians got inspired to fight foreign rule under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, later joined by Sadar Patel, Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Azad and many more. In that period, several regional and new institutions were created for revival, teaching and promotion of our dance forms, chief being the Kerala Kalamandalam in 1930s in Kerala to teach Kerala arts of Kathakali and Moiniyatam, Kalakshetra in Madras in 1940s to teach Bharatanatyam and Tagore's own Santi Niketan in 1930s to teach Manipuri, Kathakali and all other available forms. Once India became independent in 1947, lots of forms got a shot in the arm as it were and overnight under the overall nationalist fervor and spirit of revival, many institutions were created that helped teach and train new adherents.
in Delhi, an enlightened industrious family created the Bharti Kala Kendra, which also housed the Kathak Kendra, Nati Ballet Center, Delhi Ballet Center, and a host of institutions came up all over the country, too many to recount here. The first generation of star dancers, India produced Arudhai Shankar, whose discovery by Anne Pavlova sparked a creative partnership in London and Paris. Soon Shankar returned to India to set up his own dance company and engage many, including musicians like Alauddin Khan Sahib, Timir Baran and Vishnudas Shirali to create everlasting works. His younger brother Ravi Shankar distinguished himself as a world-class sitarist in classical dance, Ram Gopal of Bangalore put three classical dance forms, Bharatanatyam, Kathak and Kathakali on world map. These two call, can be called pioneers for they believed in Indian dance and helped reach out as early as the 1930s and 1940s. They went to the gurus in the villages and sought to learn from them.